nothing like a little wake up to start the day in Creative University Session 2. Hi, I'm Peter Chotti. Thanks for joining today. I'm the founder of Creative University and also the chairman and founder of Creative Media. And it's good to have session number two. Session number one is going to be on the website. But everybody, welcome to this session, uh, which is about the state of the music industry today during the pandemic, crazy pandemic times, where we are today and where we're going from here. So there's a lot to cover today. I'm gonna go in rapid fire because there's so much ground to cover and I want to make sure that we have time for Q and A and take your questions. And just so you all know, you're on Zoom video conference and so you are muted right now. If you have any questions, don't hesitate, unmute yourself and then let me know. Otherwise you can try to chat to me too. At the end of this session, I've created a deck here that I'll take you through. Feel, don't feel the need to take notes on this because at the end of the session, I'll send you the deck via the chat box below. So that way you'll be freed up to ask questions, but let's go through rapid fire, okay? So let's, let's begin because we have an hour. Uh, so first of all, I just want to reiterate what Creative University is, its mission and vision. Some of you joined last week, not all of you joined last week. I'm not gonna go through it in detail. You can find a lot more information on the Creative University website. The link is below here on the slide. And you know, basically it, this is for you, for students, exclusively for students, meant to be a hub of learning, inspiration, opportunities, including internships that I'm gathering from other experts who are in the industry. And so you have a place to go and learn more about the media and entertainment and tech world. So the what, the why, the what, the goals of it, how we do it with live webinars, Q and A and all that, you can find out more information there on the website. Uh, one important thing, because there are internships that we anticipate bringing on board here as a hub, uh, as we grow this organically and scholarships in the form of like one-to-one -one mentoring with experts in the industry who are volunteering and who are really, really good and you could benefit a lot from. And ultimately more than that, if you want those deeper opportunities, more than just the live webinars, then the commitment is to apply on the website, on the Creative University website, and you'll see what the process is there because we wanna see who's really dedicated to this, who's really committed to it, who, who um, really proves that they, they are passionate about the space and they wanna get into it. So that's an important thing. Uh, just a quick announcement about next week's session, which is going to be on Thursday, not Friday. And I'm thinking about moving these sessions to Thursday instead of Fridays. So keep note of this. But next week, really excited. One of the first interviews of new CEO Kevin Mayer, who's now the new CEO of TikTok, uh, which I'm sure all of you use. It's one of the biggest uh, companies in the media and entertainment music space in the world, if not the biggest at this point in time. So Kevin, who I'm known for a long, long time, many, many years, is joining me for a conversation and QA session next Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific. You're not going to want to miss that one. You're going to want to tell your friends about this one. Kevin is not available. He's, he's very difficult to schedule. And so this is a real, uh, I, I'm very excited for him to join us. So the registration link is there. I'll also add it to the Creative University website. It's not there yet. So make sure you use this registration link. Okay, with that, I'm gonna set the stage, set the stage of where we are today in the music industry. Uh, so obviously these are crazy times. These are crazy, crazy times. And basically we have this in-home entertainment and out-of-home entertainment dichotomy where in-home entertainment, because we're all locked in in our quarantines uh, and most of us are still abiding by a lot of those kind of restrictions, thankfully, that's a good thing, are going to be using more and more in-home choices like the Netflix, like eSports, like those kinds of things. And obviously touring, concerts, festivals, movies, movie theaters have essentially shut down. And so that's the big state of play that defines the music business as well as all the other parts of the industry now in these pandemic, these crazy unprecedented pand pandemic times versus how they were before. So let's get into how they were before. So coming into this, 
the recorded music business was about total, all, global total recorded music market. So not including live music, about $20 billion, which is significantly up after years of decline where we had CD sales that were decimated by online streaming services and piracy, peer-to-peer -peer piracy. So there was doom and gloom in the music business up until about two, three years ago, up until very recently. And finally now, everybody in the business is beginning to understand that, uh, that streaming is not the nemesis. Streaming has become the savior for the industry and is growing so rapidly. So we see that Goldman Sachs, which is a major analyst, that experts in the space that track these things and forecast these things, looks, that, looks like the market or anticipates the market's going to rise from $20 billion, what it was total in 2019, to about $45 billion by the end of this, this next decade, by 2030. Streaming accounts for 80% of those revenues now. Think about that. Streaming was nowhere to be found just a few years back. That's how rapidly things have changed. And just a quick personal anecdote, back in 2002, 2003, 2004, I was president of a company called Music Match, and we were the first ones to negotiate on-demand streaming licenses with the major labels and indie labels. And this was in a period where nobody believed that streaming would ever be, amount to anything because this was now 18, 17 years ago. Even Steve Jobs said at the time that consumers are never going to want to quote unquote rent music because they want to own it. They want to own the music through downloads. And of course, downloads fueled iTunes and Apple's revenues for years and years and years. Well, here we are. Took a while, but here we are. Streaming is the savior. And again, as I mentioned, this does not include global live music market, which had been forecast by PricewaterhouseCoopers, another major analyst in the space, to reach about $30 billion in the next couple of years. But that was then. And I'll get into the live music world and where it is today and some inside information I have from uh, experts in the space. So in this streaming dominated world, we have a lot of players, obviously. Spotify is the most dominant player globally, has massive, massive numbers, um, a substantial free user base, but shockingly about 45 to 50% of users also pay for the service, which is unprecedented for an uh, for a subscription streaming service. But here's the thing that, um, and kind of the dirty little secret. So the more Spotify makes and it's making billions of dollars, the more it loses. So Spotify has never been profitable on an ongoing basis. Spotify has had two quarters, I believe in the last, since its inception like 15 years ago where it's been profitable, that's it. And the reason why, and something important to know is that because it has these, what they call variable costs, which are licensing fees to the labels, to the artists, with every dollar that's spent, about 70% of that goes to the label, the music label, and to the artist, which leaves very little left for Spotify because they have their operational costs on top of that. So Spotify, as massive as it is, has to figure out a way to make money and actually make money without these variable costs. And it's betting a substantial piece of that on podcasts. So if you, if you listen to podcasts, then you'll know that Spotify is now focusing significantly on podcasts. That's a big bet there. And even podcast behavior has changed significantly during the pandemic because we're not in our cars anymore. We're not driving nearly as much. And a lot of people listen to podcasts in their cars. So the type of podcasts have changed, et cetera. Um, but look beyond the obvious ones like, Apple Music and Spotify and Amazon, uh, Amazon Music Unlimited, lots of big players in this space. And look at the international market too. Tencent is a major company based out of China that's a conglomerate that also has some very interesting music services. I'll talk about it a little bit later. And also TikTok, of course, and we know about TikTok. In TikTok about a year ago in the United States, maybe a little more than that, I know from my own uh, kids who are now 17 and 20 that TikTok was a joke about a year ago to them at least, but then now it has its, uh, now it's become much more legitimate in the minds of, of young people in the US too, because it's not just about music. It's not just about um, karaoke like it was initially. So 
And then really quickly, music streaming on a whole is down during this pandemic. So that's a problem for the streaming services because again, we're out and about less. We're listening to our mobile devices less. We're leaning back on our couches more and watching things more. And then there's other things that, in terms of trends of where things were as we got to the pandemic. The role of AI, of course, in home assistants like Amazon Echo with Alexa and Siri. And this has been a boon, which is a good thing for these streaming services because now we, you have them bundled or integrating directly into them. So there's more consumption. We're listening more because it's so much easier to do. Of course, these devices are listening to us too. So, you know, there are those privacy issues, but if you put those aside, then you have that kind of enjoyable consumption. And then really interesting, just touch upon a new consumer electronic form factors, because over time as technology changes, of course, there's more and more ways to enjoy music. And here's just an example. Apple's you know, AirPods shockingly are anticipated to generate $18 billion of revenue just in this year, 18 billion, which is 6% of Apple's overall revenues, which is pretty unprecedented when you think about it. So that's just a kind of a touch of where things are as we headed into the pandemic and the impacts on the pandemic. So I, let me stop right there and ask if there are any questions. And if you have any questions, then unmute yourself and feel free to ask, and then we'll go rapid fire into the next several slides. Yeah, I'm curious what you think will happen now that Spotify and Amazon are in a battle with the publishers and um, you know, rights holders to songs and they're trying to change the revenue split again. And you know, given what you said about how their business is already not profitable, yeah. what yeah. do you think is going to happen? Because it seems like there's just a, a finite pie that can only be sliced in so many ways. Um, and also, um, what do you think about Apple Music not getting involved in that? Yeah, yeah. well, first of all, I'm glad you asked. Uh, here's the, the other dirty little secret. You have Apple Music, you have Amazon, you have some of these companies that have Google that are monsters that um, use content, so music in this particular case, to drive their core business. Whereas Spotify, it's purely about the music and that's all it can monetize. It can only make money through music. Well. Apple, as we've always known from the beginning, Apple has always used content, so videos and music, to lure us in as a marketing device to get us in so that we buy Apple products and that's where they make their money. So even if Apple loses money on its music service, it still makes money overall in massive amounts. And so music is seen as a marketing expense. Amazon's the same way. Amazon uses content like music in driving us into the Amazon store so we buy more and that's how it makes its money. So those massive behemoths have a lot more flexibility in terms of negotiating deals that are more favorable to artists and to labels than a Spotify does. So a Spotify comes to the labels and says, we're losing money hand over fist. And that's not gonna change unless you help us out. And they've, they've been able to negotiate better deals because of that. And the labels are faced with the choice of, are they just going to, continue to support the behemoths out there and let them win when they have such a tremendous advantage over the business model of, of a Spotify, which is a pure play. And so uh, the way I see it is that Spotify, even though it's massive, is less threatening and the labels and the artists want Spotify and other independents to survive uh, because otherwise you have Apple dominating and Amazon dominating and they don't want that. Okay. Uh, Anuma, is that good? Did you get, okay, cool. So let's talk about the live scene really quickly. So as I mentioned, the live music concert scene was estimated to reach about $30 billion in the next couple of years. And a big part of that is we, you know, although I'm not, I'm certainly not Jed Y and Z, but I live it, you know, the outside, out of home entertainment experiences, matter to me, matter to my family, and it's certainly from all the surveys matter more to Gens Y and Z, where experiences over time are lasting in ways that other things are not, and so prioritize that. And that's one of the reasons why just kind of this, this, this change in terms of overall generational thinking has grown music events substantially, and that continues to rise, or continued to rise. But now with the pandemic, 
we're seeing that the losses will be substantial because touring has stopped, festivals have stopped. And so Polestar, which is a major, major resource in the music business, estimates that $9 billion of the industry will be lost, $9 billion. And you'll see what I added here was just a chart of the stock price, the stock performance of Live Nation, you know, the major, the major promoter and um, venue holder in the United States. And you'll see that where it was chugging along at a very high price and then it dropped off a cliff because of the pandemic. It has bounced back since then. So if you bought at the drop, you'd be happy. <laughs> but ultimately, you know, this is where the live music business is going. And then just really quickly, here's something that's a fascinating, has anybody out there heard of the MSG sphere? Oh, okay. Yeah, I've heard of it. Okay, the MSG sphere is Madison Square Garden. So Madison Square Garden Group uh, owns obviously that venue, a number of other venues, but also owns some television, sports channels, things like that. Well, they got out of, they're getting all, all, all out of that and focusing on the spheres. And here's a rendering of what the sphere will look like in Las Vegas. And you can see from the scale of it that true to its name, it's this massive spherical venue that is reimagining what a venue will be. It's gonna have LED lights on the outside, LED lights on the inside, and you're gonna be in the surrounded concert setting. So as you listen to music, you're gonna be bombarded with sound and pinpoint audio that's directed to your seat. And it's a 15,000-ish kind of venue. So that's already under construction, well underway. Like I said, MSG bet the farm on going into this direction. And now the music business and live music is stopped completely. So you can see the, the stock performance of Madison Square Garden Group because of it. So that's the, those are the issues now with the live scene. So how do artists mitigate this current pain that they're feeling? Because yes, of course, there are many wealthy uh, musicians out there, the mega bands, the mega artists, but most musicians, they earn their, the vast majority of their revenues by touring, by concerts, by merchandise, by fan interaction, uh, VIP treatment, things like that. Well, that has stopped and that's a real problem for musicians to just make a living and be able to continue to create. So here's some things that uh, I believe, and I write about this a lot, that musicians can do and should be doing. First of all, just like all of us in this space, any kind of creator as well, and we're all creators, whether you're in the business side, you're a creator. It's the time for experimentation. You need to be entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurial means you need to try things. You need to be afraid. You can't be afraid to fail. You just need to move on if something doesn't work, but you need to try things. So for musicians, songwriting, of course, recording, of course, because you have the tools in your own place and collaboration. And collaboration doesn't necessarily mean just with other artists. It means with also uh, service providers and a lot of early stage companies that are doing cool things would be very excited to work with you. So that's one thing. The power of IP, intellectual property means the actual songs themselves, the music publishing rights, the music master rights, that's the IP. Well, I'm, I do a lot of these kinds of deals where if you own a catalog of music or songs that are valuable, the, there's a very hot marketplace out there with buyers who are, look, who are flush with cash, who are looking to collect intellectual property rights, songs, master recordings, and pay significant numbers on those. So in the last year, I closed a deal with the band Boston. I'm sure one of your favorite bands of all time, Air Supply, um, All Out of Love, you I'm sure know that song. I won't sing it for you. And then, uh, and then uh, Count Basie. And there are a no number of other deals that I have in play right now. And it's a really powerful time. I believe it's a great thing for artists to investigate. So there's real substantial money there and resources to really grow the legacy of these artists. So it's not just a money thing. Live streaming, of course, what we're doing here. Well, artists, I'm sure you know, are doing this as best they can to stay engaged. And some of the platforms are Stage It, Patreon, Twitch, of course and Instagram. Twitch is really betting significantly on music. So you've seen that mu music has become much bigger part of its overall uh, focus in the last several months, and that's going to continue on. I mentioned a company called Bulldog Digital Media. I'm on the board of this company. Bulldog is the leader when it comes to high quality, really premium live streaming for bands. And they 
they live stream some of the, the largest events out there like Bonnaroo, et cetera. And there are a lot of features there that you can get. So with if you work with a company like Bulldog, you don't need to just be on Twitch. You can be across, syndicate your, your live stream across all social channels and then drive them back to your website and then monetize it there. So Bulldog's interesting. Other direct channels, bringing fans in. Artists should be experimenting. And one of the great experimenters out there is the musician Grimes. First of all, great music. Check out her latest album if you haven't. Uh, but Grimes had this uh, wonderful experiment of a couple months ago for the song, You'll Miss Me When I'm Not Around, where it's a green screen video that she recorded and she asked her fans to then create the video, the music video around that. So on the green screen. So now everything's customized, personalized. And uh, so it's pretty fascinating. That gets the passion going, the creativity going. And you can imagine that's great marketing for Grimes as well as just great engagement. So like, that's really interesting. TikTok, of course, is full of experimentation. And I'll mention one thing about uh, a very interesting thing that happened a couple of years ago when the movie Frozen came out. Disney is notorious for not allowing anybody to use its songs and YouTube videos, et cetera. Um, it's just very strict about its copyrights, understandably, but very strict, myopically strict. So when Frozen came out, the animated classic, the reason why it became a classic, a lot of people attributed it to the fact that for the first time, Disney allowed fans out there, kids out there, families out there to use the Frozen songs in their videos and create videos and then share them without trying to take them down. And so this became this amazing viral moment and free marketing for Disney and for the film. And so it shows you again, experimentation, trying the perhaps non-obvious ways, very successful sometimes. And then uh, virtual moments, what I mean by that is you should check out a company called Cameo. Cameo gives artists a chance from their homes, their living rooms, to be able to record personalized messages to anyone who is willing to pay a few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars, and it takes the musician five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it may be. And so you can imagine if you're an artist and a musician, you need some extra cash and you have a fan base and you can reach out to your social following, you spend a couple hours a day and you're doing 10 minute, several thousand dollars for 10 minutes of a personalized message or some kind of a personalized live stream, that adds up pretty fast. So it's a really interesting new way where you can have these virtual moments where an artist can be in many different places at any given period of time. Then immersive. So last week I had some homework for you guys. And for those of you who did it, checking out the Travis Scott Fortnite virtual event that reached 30 million people. And then, so immersive means virtual reality, augmented reality. Again, new ways for artists to engage with their fans. Technology enabling new things to do. Well, so Travis Scott, when you're able to come out and make a splash like that, that nobody had done before. Marshmallow did something similarly about a year before that, but not with the numbers and not with the in-depth immersive nature as Travis Scott did. 30 million people, imagine the marketing he got for that. All the press around the world wrote about this. That's amazing for Travis Scott. And sponsors, when you get th those kind of numbers, will pay substantial money, substantial money to sponsor that, which will then go to the artist, a substantial portion of that. So thinking out of the box that way, and I, another piece of your homework was a company called Wave, which is a company that was a startup that raised an additional $30 million the last couple of weeks to create uh, virtual events where you can, as a fan, uh, attend that virtual event as an avatar. So it's a, it's a new way of immersively joining an event via, um, via your home or wherever you are using your virtual reality. So any questions about a couple of these things? And remember, we'll have more Q&A at the end. So maybe just one, two. Okay, I'm gonna go rapid fire then. So where's the music world going post pandemic? Well, I'm a believer because of what I said, where 
we're an increasingly heads down society where we're, you know, we, we're doing this and which is great, well and good, not particularly memorable. And so there's this, I, I write about this a lot where I believe there's this very real human need to engage with each other, to get out of the home, to have, um, to rub shoulders with other people, to interact and experience lasting experiences. And again, the surveys from Gens Y and Z shows that that is there. So crazy times right now. I ultimately believe that, that music touring and festivals will come back, but it's gonna take a significant amount of time, obviously, for the larger venues. And insiders in the, in the major event business are telling me that the expectation, what they're really planning on now, is that the large festivals and events won't come back until the fall of 2021. That's the high level thinking, so imagine that. All the more reason why artists and musicians need to be doing the experimentation I talked about on the earlier slide. So crazy, crazy times. Artist, artist collaboration with remote collaborative tools. That has been accelerated because of the fact that we're stuck and we need to try to do the best we can collaborating virtually and remotely. So that's gonna continue on. And then new ways to scale, personalize and monetize, which means make money. Uh, with from your fans, so artists from fans and fan engagement, a couple of them. So TikTok will likely, and I, they may have already started, begin to borrow the business model, the free to play business model of the games business, which has been, which has made games a an industry which far towers over the music business in terms of the the numbers that it generates on a global basis and towers over the, the movie business too, by an order of magnitude. Large part of that is because of the free to play business model where you're lured in to play a game for free, it costs you nothing, but if you want a shield, you have a micro payment of you know, a dollar, and, and so you're in the moment, these impulse buys where it's so easy to just go check, 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 yes, I'll buy that, I'll buy that, I'll buy that. And before you know it, you've spent 10 bucks, 15 bucks. That's free to play. I believe TikTok and other services are going to start bringing in some of those services, those, those elements so that they can extract more money from you. Vest is an interesting company. I'm actually a, a, a board member of this company because I believe in it. Now, I talked about music publishing deals. Well, now you, a fan, can actually invest in a particular artist's music. And I mean literally investing. So you're buying a tiny piece of an artist's royalty stream. So the money that their songs generate over the course of time, you're able to, through Vest, find an artist, invest in them, and you're not just getting a t-shirt out of it, you're actually getting an ownership piece of that. So if the royalties, as that royalty stream grows because that artist is doing cooler stuff and experimenting more successfully, then you'll make money. It's like having a stock. That's what it is. So Vest is really interesting. And then Ujo Music blockchain technology. So I was asked about blockchain by Sean. Um, so Sean, this Sean does. This is, um, thanks for bringing that to my attention. Yes, blockchain technology is a fascinating new ways to for the artist to get rid of the middleman, the service provider, the Spotify's of the world, the Apple Music of the world, where now an artist through blockchain is going to be able to securely distribute their own music uh, and other forms of content and have the rules of how, how much you pay, they can define them, the accounting for it, so it's all very easy. That's all in the encrypted blocks of, that are attached to each other. And so the artist knows exactly where the music is gone. It's encrypted, so it's secure. Um, and then they can identify exactly how much money they're making if the artist chooses to make money from it. So Ujo Music is one blockchain company. And then last week I mentioned some homework for those of you who wanted to. The reason why I mentioned Red Pill VR. Red Pill VR is, brings music experiences to tel in a teleportation kind of way. It's pretty fascinating. You should go to their website, check it out, where it's more than just virtual reality. Now, through virtual reality, I can be in my home listening to and watching, uh, let's say Diplo, uh, who's on stage someplace and I actually can join, and he's live streaming. He's live streaming his set. 
I can join him on that stage, interact with him live, even though he's thousands of miles away. And my friends can join me from the comfort of their own home live too. And we can dance and be around the entire environment and hard to describe, but I've, I've used it before and it's unbelievable. So red pill is a really interesting point in the way of the future. And then very quickly, autonomous cars, self-driving cars, cars are already entertainment centers. We listen to music, we watch videos in them, hopefully now while driving. Um, and they're going to be fully autonomous in the upcoming years. And so then what are you doing? You're there. They become essentially entertainment centers to, as you pass the time, as you're going to destination. So music's going to play a big part of that immersively. I mentioned hyperloops too. And hyperloops are, uh, if, if you're not familiar with them, a new form of transportation that's being built right now in test stages by Elon Musk and others that I think it's conceptually, you can travel from Los Angeles to San Francisco in something like 30 minutes time through an underground tunnel, essentially. It's, uh, uh, I'm not even gonna try to describe it, but Hyperloop is a transportation of the future that's being invented as we speak. And you can imagine same kind of thing as I mentioned in cars, entertainments could be a big part of it. And then to really blow your minds, there's a futurist known as Ray Kurzweil, who is one of the most noted futurists out there today and has been for years. He, he believes that by the year 2035, we're all going to be able to literally, not figuratively, have our brains tapped into the cloud. So through electrodes, we're able to harness the power of the cloud, the CPU power of the cloud, which sounds insane, but that's what's being developed now. And again, our good friend Elon Musk is at the forefront of doing that, which doesn't surprise you because he, has, he doesn't have enough things to do already with SpaceX and everything else. Um, but his company is called Neuralink and they're impl they're, he plans to start experimenting with implanting tiny chips in human brains, test subjects, in the next couple of years. I think the, the pandemic has slowed things down, but he was planning to start either this year or next year. But think about it, but it's not just him. Google, Facebook, many more are really banking that this is the future. So what does that mean for music? What does that mean for all forms of entertainment? Well, we may not need AirPods anymore. And then finally, yes, that's as that's where things may be heading, but still getting back to the fundamental belief that I have, and I think that um, probably many of you have here, nothing's going to replace real human interaction. Nothing will. And let's hope it doesn't, at least I hope it doesn't. And, and I absolutely don't believe, and I, I think actually human, real human interactions could become increasingly important, live music experiential again. So my spotlight question last week was about live music events and what happens to them post pandemic. And so as one example, if any of you have gone to an uh, EDM tent and danced and then how everybody's compressed with one another, jumping and sweating and, and listening to the music, what's gonna happen post pandemic once it's safe to go out and attend events? Are those close quartered EDM type compressed events, are they gone? Or how do you feel they'll evolve? Does anybody want to tackle that and give their thoughts about what they believe is going to happen? Um, I, I was sort of curious, like, when you asked that question, is, I, I, don't, I don't really think that uh, festival goers, like, who are, you know, really into that side of social life, I don't think they'll compromise. Um, if, if enough time has passed, I don't think they'll compromise for a pandemic. I just don't, I just, I think it's too big of a market and I think that it's too, they, they love it too much. There's too much of an intense crowd for that kind of thing. Any contrarians out there? Thanks, I think Jack. what's, I think what they'll do in the beginning, the promoters and the, the people putting on the shows, especially because of, you know, liability and they don't want any outbreaks is they're going to have to limit how it's set up. So the Sahara tent won't be built in a way where it can fit so many people. Um, so they'll either break it up into smaller stages, have smaller capacity. But I agree uh, with what Jack said. Like overall, I think things are going to go back to how they were, especially hopefully once the vaccine comes. 
or on the other hand, once people just start forgetting about this period and want to go back, um, I, I, I don't think that's going to last. The distancing is going to last very long. Yeah. And I, and, and sort of like, I think a lot of festival goers too are, you know, in the age range, 18 to 29, 30. And I, it's just for, I think for a lot of people who are that age, I just don't think it's, um, they don't consider it to be that big of a threat to them. Yeah. I don't know. I know here in Toronto, uh, after like immediately after they lifted even just a few of the social distancing protocols, I know like people, uh, like, you know, uh, teenagers and young adults immediately <laughs> in my neighborhood, especially I live, uh, lives near a beach, but people just started absolutely like packing together in these massive groups all together, just absolutely packing really close together, going out for these beach par parties and stuff. So I think it's going to happen pretty quickly once uh, all this is, you know, quote unquote over, uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, yeah, that that stuff's gonna come back pretty much because I mean it's already like if, if anything I think it's gonna come back even faster than most people realize because like younger people the second they can they're going to want to come back together in those larger groups because like I saw I saw firsthand the second uh, we lifted even just a few of those protocols just younger people just immediately flocked together. Yeah. <laughs> Any other any other thoughts out there? Thanks, Julia. Okay, so it, it's it, uh, for what it's worth, I, I agree with you. I think it's inevitable that it's such a massive, um, it's 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 such a part of the, our our culture and and such a unique form of experience that I, I don't see it going in, away anytime soon. But it's going to take a long. It's going to take a while for it to build up to where it was, and and the pressure on promoters like uh, Golden Voice for Coachella is going to be substantial to try to find a way, at least create a story where they can support it and say that it's safe. So that's going to be a fascinating thing to watch. A couple other things I, I mentioned here. There's a company called Vortex Immersive Domes uh, or Vo Vor Vortex Immersion Media. And they create dome events um, and they can be up to 5,000 people or they can be as small as 50 people. And so think of it as, as virtual reality, community virtual reality experiences in 360 degree amazing sound and visuals and without the need for wearing any kind of headsets. I'm a believer in that being something that's going to be rolling out over time and scaling nicely so you can have substantial numbers of those across the globe and part of a tour, in fact, so an artist can create something, some unique experience and they don't necessarily need to be there and yet they'll be generating revenues. And then probably the coolest experiential event that I experienced in 2019, and I think my family will agree with me, was something called Wolf in the Wonder Show, which was in a downtown Los Angeles warehouse. Uh, and it was a show called Cages by Wolf in the Wonder Show. I put the link here to check out the trailer for it and it doesn't do the experience justice, but it's the future of entertainment for me where it combines, it's part Les Mis, part Kanye, part cinema, part uh, hologram, and it all comes together with amazing music and a story which is at the core of it. And so unfortunately, of course, the pandemic shut it down and these guys were a small little company. Let's hope because it was amazing and I want you all to experience it. Uh, I think it will blow minds. And then just one, one thing I think is important in general, not just in the music world. We frequently assume that the big guys of today, you know, the, the leaders of today in the media and entertainment and tech world will be here forever and ever and ever. They'll just be here because they're too big to fail at this point. But as we've seen from over the past couple of decades, that's not true. So you have companies like Kodak, this was like 25 years ago and before all your times, but they were monsters when it came to the, um, the picture, the um, photographic world. And, but they didn't evolve into the digital world and Kodak then went bankrupt. Kodak, that brand that had been around for a hundred years is essentially gone now. Blockbuster video, I don't know how many of you remember Blockbuster, but that's where we used to all get, all get our DVDs of course. 
and Blockbuster had the world, you know, it had the world in its hands. And it should have seen that all of this is going online for streaming, but they didn't for some reason, or they put their heads in the sand because they liked all the money that was coming in at the time. And guess what? Blockbuster came into the streaming world too late and that there were blockbusters on every corner in every city. They're completely gone, completely gone. And then Yahoo, I have a personal experience here. They bought the company I mentioned, Music Match, back in 2004, and they paid a nice price for it. And then ultimately, there's, and they had Yahoo Music, and ultimately that went out of business, and they essentially crushed what they bought from us, and then they crushed their own music strategy because Yahoo was bloated and just didn't have a, didn't have any kind of real focus or did, they didn't empower their management team to do anything. So again, Yahoo, look at these numbers. Microsoft offered to buy Yahoo for $45 billion in 2008. When they sold to Verizon uh, in, I think it was 2018, they sold it for one tenth that. Think about that. And then TikTok was nowhere to be found a couple of years ago. It started off as Musical.ly, and Musical.ly, you, I'm sure many of you, Musical.ly, uh, ByteDance, which is the parent company out of China for TikTok, bought Musical.ly for a billion dollars. And in the last couple of years, TikTok has become probably the biggest story in the music world, uh, especially this last year. And what it's worth, a lot more than a billion dollars. So that's how fast things go. And then here's a quote from Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, where he tells his people, this is a quote at a company meeting, I predict one day Amazon will fail. And whether he really means that or if he's just trying to spur his people into action, still, it's a good reminder. So, and then we'll get into Q&A, don't worry. But I'm gonna mention some homework for this week because I mentioned the homework that was last week. This is only for those of you, you don't need to do this. All of Creative University is voluntary. It's all voluntary. but. I try to curate, I try to identify things, trends, stories, companies that are doing really interesting things that are good to know about because it will help you think perhaps in ways that you otherwise wouldn't, may not be obvious. So one spotlight company is a company called Mondo Media. Mondo, actually I say here in this deck that John, who's the, the founder of it, is next Friday's guest. That's being changed. Um, I'm rescheduling John because Kevin from TikTok can only do next week. And so we're going to focus on, we're going to, we're going to have John featured a couple weeks later. Uh, but Mondo Media is a great company that was focused on animated content for young adults. And that business is growing substantially. And John has been incredibly successful as an entrepreneur, raised over a hundred million dollars in capital, um, had some nice big wins. And um, I think that the channels that he programmed had over 7 billion video views on, on uh, YouTube. So big deal. Bulldog Digital Me Media, I mentioned to you that they're the live streaming experts. I had a live webinar with the CEO, John Petricelli, a couple of weeks ago. Here's the link to it where he's the expert. He's the leading expert in the world when it comes to live streaming of major events. And now he's also focusing on, on direct artist fan engagement during like these pandemic times. So it's worth watching. If you're interested, it's really worth watching because he's, he's really good. And then here's some articles that I identified. Spotify staking its, its future on podcasts and what that means and how consumer behavior has changed during the pandemic. TikTok, this is um, the announcement of Kevin just from a few weeks ago when he left Disney, he was one of the top couple executives of Disney. So Kevin, he's a, he is a very significant figure in the media and entertainment space. So this was a very unexpected announcement in the industry that he was going to TikTok. And so this is the announcement, which is good background prior to the conversation I have with him next week. Musicians, what you need to know about your managers aren't telling you. This gets into the, the acquisition of publishing and master rights that I was talking about earlier, which is a core part of what I do. And these are part one and part two articles. Read both of them if, if you're interested. I wrote these articles in Forbes, Forbes magazine, and it, it lays out the flavors, the different flavors of acquisition deals that are out there. So that will give you good background. 
And then a non-music article about Quibi. Does anybody here, I'm, I'm very curious, any of you out there, do you know about Quibi? Yeah, I see that. Uh, yeah, isn't it like a short form, uh, like Netflix, like short form media Netflix or something? Yeah, yeah, kind of. How many of you have actually, if you've tried it, just say yes, because I'm curious if any of you has, have actually used it. Wow, that's the problem. <laughs> that's the problem. So Quibi is the new company from Jeffrey Katzenberg, who's one of the legends in traditional media. He was, um, he was running Disney back in the 80s. And then he went from there to start DreamWorks with Steven Spielberg, and he ultimately sold DreamWorks. Then he came in and he bought um, um, uh, one of the early pioneers when it came to a video, like short form video for mobile devices and such, and sold that and had a very big success story there. So he was not just a traditional media guy. He saw the changes of the past decade coming in plate and went into them. So what was his next act? It was to start Quibi, which as you were saying, Jack, Quibi is essentially taking Hollywood stories and Hollywood budgets, so movies, and breaking them up into little chapters. So imagine like a Steven Spielberg movie, but he, it's created to be this way, that instead of it's a full length, it's broken down into little chapters of 10 minutes or less, so you can watch these while you're getting your coffee at Starbucks or whatever. So it's really focused on, but it's focused on young people. It's focused on uh, 18 to 34 year olds, not for people like me. And it's, uh, so that's the target with these kinds of stories and these, these kind of Hollywood budgets. But so far, you, the target audience, none of you have tried it. And that's the problem. So the word is getting out right now and you should read this article to learn more that um, Quibi's not really hitting the mark. And that's, you know, so now what? Because they've raised $1.6 billion because it's Jeffrey Katzenberg. Every single, tr every single major studio is invested in Quibi. So it's a fascinating story for what it's worth. Um, I was always skeptical. I wanted to believe, but I was always skeptical for it. I wrote a lot about it because um, I, I applauded them for their experimentation. But the marketing has clearly not hit. So that's a very interesting data point. So the spotlight questions for next week, I had a spotlight question about Coachella and dancing and EDM and how that's going to come back is, how should TikTok evolve? And keep that in mind because we're going to be talking to Kevin next week. And I'm curious to get where, your mu where you get your music fix. What services do you use? If you want to answer those questions and perhaps be featured in a newsletter that goes out to about 1500 experts in the space through my creative media company, then submit your video answers to these email addresses here. Okay. And then just for kicks, because we're talking about music, I want to bring this uh, probably my favorite, favorite artist of the last decade. If anybody likes mellow, I like all kinds of music, but if anybody likes some good mellow acoustic, beautiful songs, beautiful, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't color it, but this is an amazing artist to me. And I believe that some of you out there will like him. Radical Face, is, it's a solo singer. That's what he goes by. Those are two songs to check out to get a taste of it. And like I say, just trust me. So next week's session is, as I said, Kevin Mayer. It's really going to be a treat. And then upcoming session, we're going to have John Evershed, who's the CEO of uh, the former CEO of Mondo Media and now runs a company called High Concentrate. And he's going to be talking of the importance of storytelling as you lay out your career. So very career focused on how to create your story to make the biggest impact when you look for opportunities out there. Great guy, really good guy. And then some other future webinars that I plan to host are it's kind of like what I'm doing here for the music industry, but for the video industry, TVs, movies, social video, immersive entertainment, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, live experiential entertainment, out of home entertainment, really, crowd investing, so investment venture capital investing and entrepreneurialism, 
or suggest another topic and we'll get the experts to do it. Because again, this is, Creative University is for you guys. It's for you guys. This is meant to help you, inspire you, give you some, some resources that are not, and insights otherwise not available. And so send your choices of what you want, and all of you should do this, to these names here and these email addresses, okay? So with that, we have some time, and I, I'll give as much time as people want, to some Q&A about any of this or other questions you may have. Come on. I'm sure some of you have some questions. I'm curious what you think is going to happen with all of these streamers. I mean, we know it seems like every other day a new one is getting announced. And, you know, just given the amount of subscription fees and all of this, it seems like the amount that these companies are paying is not sustainable for all the content. Like, even for Netflix, I don't see how they're going to be able to support themselves, even though they're trying to push international and all of these things. So, I wonder what you think is the end game for all these streamers. Because I also find it hard to believe that all of them are getting in the game without it being profitable for them at the end of the day. Well, I completely agree with you. Um, it's, you have this more so on the video side than on the music side, because the music side, you have some like really firmly entrenched, well, you do on the video side too, massive players that kind of own the market. And, but the themes, the high level themes apply to both video and to music, which is, it's hard to compete as an independent when you're going up against the Apples, the Amazons, the Googles of the world and others who have what I talked about before, they make money in so many other ways that are the, that's their core business. And so if you're a, what I call pure plays, and I write about this a lot too, if you're a pure play service and you're only monetizing the music or the videos, then you're stuck. That's all you can do unless you find other ways that are creative to bring in additional revenue sources. Whereas, those behemoths, the monsters out there, they can make money off all the hardware or the shopping that you do. And so it's the marketing expense. They can lose money on the service, whereas the Spotify's and Netflix of the world, I agree with you on Netflix, by the way, they can't. They, they don't have that flexibility. They need to make money on their business. And here's another dirty little secret about Netflix. I'm uh, as a... Uh, <laughs> My wife constantly reminds me, um, I write a lot and have for years about Netflix and I've been bearish on Netflix for years, consistently. And yet Netflix's stock keeps going up, 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 up. And the pandemic has certainly helped Netflix because we're, we're binging more than ever on Netflix while we're locked down. But here's the, the reality is Netflix is profitable from an accounting standpoint and I'm not gonna get into any more detail. They're profitable, but they are losing money. Uh, every, as they get bigger, they lose more money because they too have their, their expenses when it comes to their, their original programming strategy. This year alone, they were on track to spend over $17 billion on content. $17 billion on content. And that's their game, they need to keep keep bringing fresh content in, in order to compete against all the others that are up against it. And that's, and it's much more crowded now with Disney Plus, um, with HBO Max, on and on and on and on to your point. And so I think, I ultimately have always said that while I love Netflix, I want it to succeed, it either must expand how it makes money or it ultimately will be bought by somebody else. So Netflix will not go away, but the business model to me doesn't work long-term. Just like for Spotify, Spotify faces similar challenges uh, for you know, similar reasons. They're pure play services. So those are, and those are all big guys. Netflix and Spotify are big. So again, to your, your question about all these new services out there, if you're starting a music service or if you're starting a, a video service, how can you compete? How can you even enter the game against these established players that have you know, the the means to be able to, to be, to win in this space and have already owned a lot of the territory. Well, on the video side, my recommendation is to focus on a particular passionate niche audience that you can, um, 
that you can create a better user experience for, a better content experience for than a generalist like a Netflix or an Amazon Prime Video. So if there's a specific demographic that you're, or lifestyle that you're trying to target, you, you have a chance to win there because if you, if you have a better experience for that particular demographic or lifestyle, then the, that audience base is gonna be more passionate about the service and that means they're more willing to support that service and pay dollars to support that service. So I think that's the way to win. And looking at beyond just advertising dollars and beyond just subscription revenues. So, you know, create merchandise, whatever it may be. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, of course. Any others? Okay, so we're almost at the hour point. I just, here's more, it's part of my give back too, um, where I wrote this book that I'm continuing to update throughout the pandemic, probably like every month and a half uh, to keep it fresh, fresh, fresh. But I just wrote it in the first few weeks of the pandemic um, about the overall media and entertainment world and where it is and where it's going. So a, a lot of the themes I touched upon in the music side You'll find them there, but in much more detail. And then you'll find other stories there about uh, whether it's video space, or motion pictures, television, where it's going, esports, sports, uh, live experiential, et cetera. It's all in there, including some predictions, some specific predictions. So then you guys can slam me when I'm wrong. Um, but that's available for free. Go to the website and you'll be able to get it, request it, and then I'll send it off to you. Okay. So remember, Sign up for this one, uh, and I'm excited by it. Should be a good one. And if you have, a, please send your feedback, your comments, your suggestions to the emails that are in this deck. Thanks, everybody.